An interesting uh, topic today. On April 17th in 2016, several celebrations happened. For those keeping track, April 17th was the Rugby Club of York's official celebrated 100th anniversary. I celebrated yet another birthday. And certainly a subset of Pennsylvanians celebrated Governor Tom Wolf signing into law uh, Senate Bill 3, better known as the Medical Marijuana Law, which was approved by the Senate House earlier that month. The bill legally removed state-level criminal penalties on the use, possession, cultivation of marijuana by patients who possess or sign, possess a signed recommendation from their physician stating that marijuana may mitigate his or her debilitating medical uh, symptoms. Pennsylvania joined 28 other states and District of Columbia which currently have laws legalizing marijuana in some form. Our speaker today is Eric Haggerty. He's a special assistant to Governor Wolf who will speak about the new law allowing medical marijuana to be grown and sold in Pennsylvania. Eric, who headed up the working group on the legislation, will discuss the legislative process, including how and why the bill was passed. He'll also discuss key aspects of the law, including forms of medical marijuana allowed in treatable conditions, distribution of permits, taxation structure, and scientific research. Eric will cover the implementation process to date, including what we learned from other states, the legislative working groups drafting temporary regulations and the application process for the grower, processor, and dispensing permits. The last part of his presentation will be concentrating on where do we go from here, including patient and physician registration, anticipated economic impact, and what we can expect from the new administration in Washington, D.C., as state laws and federal laws don't currently match up. For our Rotarians and guests, please warmly welcome Special Assistant to the Governor, Eric Packard. Hello everyone, um, my name is Eric Haggerty, uh, it's an honor to be here to talk to you today. I'm ordinarily pretty nervous about public speaking, but I spiked all of your meals with samples of medical marijuana, so uh, the joke is on you. Uh, uh, thank you for that kind introduction. Today I'll walk through the, uh, the law, our implementation progress to date, and, and where we're headed. Um, before I do that though, I do want to briefly touch on how we got here because I think it's an important piece of this. Um, I think many of you probably feel today the way I did and many other legislators and, and elected officials felt initially about medical marijuana, uh, which is that it is a front for hippies who want to listen to the Grateful Dead in their basements. Um, not that there's anything wrong with the Grateful Dead fans. Uh, so I, I think there's a, a, an immense degree of skepticism in the Capitol, certainly, over this program. And, of course, Harrisburg is also not exactly known to be a place uh, full of bipartisan compromise. Uh, medical marijuana has not historically been uh, an issue championed by the Republican Party. Yet here we are today with a bipartisan uh, supported bill implementing uh, this program, which was championed by uh, Senator Mike Palmer, a Republican senator. Uh, who deserves immense credit for us being here. And I, I think the key thing to understand about this is the, the almost overnight change in opinion is solely due to a very dedicated group of moms who called themselves the Campaign for Compassion. And these moms have children um, with varying conditions, whether it be epilepsy, autism, and they camped out every day in the Capitol uh, with every legislator told their stories about how their children were not finding uh, appropriate relief through traditional pharmaceuticals and therapeutic practices. But when experimenting with medical marijuana, uh, a child who was having you know, 100 seizures a day was now having five seizures a day or one a week. Um, and it's really a credit to these moms that opinion was changed almost overnight on this issue. And I know we're, we'll talk a lot about the industry and uh, some of the economics of this, but I, I just mention that because it's important to remember this is ultimately a patient-centered program, uh, and, and it, it's really about providing relief to these children and, and adults who are, are suffering from these conditions. Um, it's also an important political lesson, which is that 
it is impossible for us to say no to a very nice group of moms who will not leave our offices. So, um, with that, So what's in the law itself? First and foremost, the law provides for 17 different conditions that are allowable to be treatable under the law. Uh, for those who uh, can't see in the back, uh, it's cancer, mm -hmm. HIV, uh, lateral sclerosis, Crohn's disease, multiple, multiple sclerosis, um, plant is blocking the uh, second and third ones. So uh, I'll move on to Huntington's disease, Crohn's disease, uh, PTSD, intractable seizures, glaucoma, sickle cell anemia, chronic pain, and autism. Um, there are uh, six methods of application that patients will be able to use to administer medical marijuana. Uh, I want to note here that uh, many of these treatments are non-hallucinogenic by design. And you'll also note that uh, dry leaf and plant form is not on this list. So smoking marijuana remains illegal in, in Pennsylvania. I know Patty was hoping to put up a saran wrap greenhouse in his backyard, but uh, unfortunately you'll have to wait for now. Uh, probably of primary urgency in the law to many of the parents that lobbied on its behalf are uh, the safe harbor provision the safe harbor provision allows uh, parents, legal guardians, caregivers, and spouses of minors to obtain medical marijuana in a different state and possess it here without violating state law. Uh, many other states have reciprocity laws where their dispensaries will sell medical marijuana to patients from out of state if those patients can provide evidence that they're part of a program in another state. Um, so the Department of Health in early last summer began issuing these safe harbor letters to uh, parents and, and caregivers who uh, need this relief for their children and many, many people are currently taking advantage of this. <coughs> now once the program's up and running and folks don't have to rely on safe harbor letters, as you can imagine it'll be a little bit different uh, obtaining medical marijuana than your ordinary prescription. For starters, doctors will not be prescribing medical marijuana. Instead, they'll be recommending it, and they will take a series of training courses approved by the State Board of Medicine um, and register with the Department of Health, at which point they'll be able to recommend that their patients uh, begin using medical marijuana, should they choose. So a, a patient who has a recommendation from their physician will take that certification back to the Department of Health. They'll get a medical marijuana ID card uh, which will grant them access to dispensaries. And though in many cases, most likely work out at the dispensary with a medical professional on site, exactly which dosage, uh, which strain, uh, which method of application is appropriate for their, their condition. Uh, many of the treatments and strains are specifically targeted for certain conditions. It's not at all you know, a one size fits all type of thing. There are two primary permits uh, relating to industry in the law. The first is a grower and processor permit. Uh, folks who have this permit class will be able to not only grow marijuana, but distill it and produce it into its <coughs> final uh, form, the, the pill or, or oil that's ultimately sold at a dispensary. Um, the law allows uh, the state to issue up to 25 different grower and processor permits and folks interested in these permits will have to have a minimum of $2 million in capital, 500000 of which has to be on deposit with a financial institution. The second class of permits, of course, are dispensaries, which will function as the pharmacy that patients get medical marijuana at. Uh, as you can imagine, Rite Aid and CVS will not be selling this. Um, under the law, the state can issue up to 50 dispensary permits, but it's important to note that someone with a dispensary permit is allowed to open up to three different locations. So we could be looking at a total of 150 dispensaries statewide uh, by the time the program's implemented. And folks interested in this permit will need to have $150,000 on deposit with the financial institution. There is a third class of permit that we are particularly excited about and uh, 
this relates to medical research. It's a clinical registrant permit, and this permit will enable academic clinical research centers <coughs> to partner with folks in the industry to grow and dispense medical marijuana for the sole purpose of medical research. We are the only state in the country with a provision like this, and we are really excited to see uh, what sort of breakthroughs might be out there in terms of the science, which is you know, something that doctors certainly want to see uh, moved forward, and, and we want to take advantage of our incredible research institutions here in Pennsylvania. So we're particularly excited about this one. Uh, there will be up to eight different permits issued for this type of research. In terms of taxation, uh, there will be a 5% uh, gross receipts tax levied on the transaction between the grower processor and the dispensary. So it's essentially a wholesale tax, and the revenue from this tax is distributed according to a formula in the law. So 55% will go back to the Department of Health for administration of the program and offering financial incentives to folks you know, below the poverty line, for example, who can't afford the medication. 10% uh, will go to the Department of Drug and Alcohol Programs for addiction treatment and prevention services. 30% will go to research, and 5% will be returned to local police departments by the Pennsylvania Commission on Crime and Delinquency. So that is a very brief overview of what's in the law. Uh, of course, as we've begun to implement the law, um, we've taken a survey of implementation in other states, and I think we have found that every state is unique. Um, every state has its own list of conditions they treat, their own methods of application, um, and their own methods of distributing permits. But I, I think if there's uh, a, a few things in particular we've learned, the first is that it's critically important for us to roll this program out methodically and conservatively. Um, it takes a long time for the patient base to build up. It's not something where you flip a switch and overnight there are you know, a bunches of patients uh, ready to purchase this product. And in fact, many companies that enter this industry <coughs> will run on operating losses for the first several years. Uh, so it, contrary to you know, what I think a lot of folks assume, it's not an immediate cash cow for the industry. Um, so it's important to us that rather than giving out all of the permits right away, we allow the market to develop and we sort of conservatively roll them out to meet patient demand. Another concern that we see uh, from many other states is that nobody has solved the banking problem. Um, of course, conflicts with federal law mean that most of the major players, PNC, Wells Fargo, are not going to be accepting your medical marijuana company's deposits. Um, folks are relying to date on community banks and credit unions primarily. Um, so I think until we see some sort of resolution at the federal level, uh, that will continue to be the arrangement. And as we've looked at other states, we've seen that ordinarily They'll begin implementation by dumping out a set of regulations without any sort of uh, public feedback or, or participation from patients and industry. So we've, we've taken a, a little bit of a unique approach here, which is that for starters, we've assembled a bipartisan um, working group to, to craft these regulations. So we've got the Senate Democrats, the House Democrats, Senate Republicans, House Republicans, everyone's at the table. Uh, working extremely cooperatively. We, we operate on a consensus uh, basis, and it's something that I'm, I'm particularly proud of here. That we've managed to continue to keep the politics out of this because, it, again, uh, it is ultimately about the patients. Uh, in, in addition, we are rolling out regulations in phases, so uh, by subject. So, for example, to date, we've released regulations for growers and processors, dispensaries, and laboratories. Each section has had a public comment period. We've gotten tremendous <coughs> feedback from the folks in the community that, you know, had we not gotten, could have really screwed up uh, our implementation, if, you know, because we certainly don't know what we're doing, right? This is new to us, too. So uh, we've gotten tremendous feedback through this process. Uh, later in the year, we'll be issuing temporary regulations for patients, caregivers, physicians, and medical research. And these regulations will last for two years, at which point we'll have to adopt permanent regulations, which is a whole other process that I, I won't go into now. 
So the next step, uh, of course, is how are we going to distribute these permits? Uh, like I mentioned, we are going to issue them conservatively instead of all at once. We will be uh, issuing a total of 12 grower and processor permits throughout the state and 27 total dispensary permits. And, and to do this, we've divided the state into six medical marijuana regions. Uh, there will be a map on the next slide, but before we get to that, I want to explain the mechanics here. So there will be two grower and processor permits issued in each region um, to ensure that the economic benefit from this is seen throughout the state instead of concentrated in you know, Philadelphia, for example. Uh, and in, in addition to that, we have selected targeted counties that dispensary permits will be issued in. Um, so if, looking at the map here, and I, I apologize, it's a little small. We are, of course, in the South Central region. Uh, there will be four dispensary permits issued in the South Central region, one each in Blair, Cumberland, Dauphin, and York counties. Now, I, I want to emphasize here, if you remember, each permit allows you up to three dispensaries. So we are implementing a rule in which if you have a dispensary permit, your first dispensary has to be in one of those four counties that we mentioned. Your second and third have to be in a different county than your first. So we think by doing this, we've struck a balance where we'll allow the market to develop <coughs> as you know experts in the industry recognize need while also ensuring uh, a baseline uh, guarantee for patients that they'll have geographic access uh, to these dispensaries. So you could see as many as four dispensaries open up within your county uh, at the end of this phase. And as the market develops, we'll continue to issue additional permits as we see gaps in coverage. Applications for these permits are going to open up on January 17th. They'll be due back to the department on March 20th and will be reviewed by a selection committee made up of subject matter experts on various components of the application. <coughs> for example, experts in security, experts in finance, um, experts in agricultural processes. So um, because this is a pharmaceutical product in our minds, uh, it's important to us that we have a rigorous selection process. It'll be merit-based. Applicants will be able to see the scoring rubric that they're graded on when the application comes out, uh, which is another feature of our program that's pretty unique to Pennsylvania. Many other states did not do that, and they faced lawsuits you know, for the accusations of politicized scoring and, and this and that. So we're, we're again trying to keep politics out of this. That's where we are today. Um, where we're headed, I think, realistically for an industry timeline, it will, of course, take us uh, quite a bit of time to review the applications. If we receive hundreds or thousands of permit applications like we expect, uh, that'll take a significant chunk of time. Once permits are issued, uh, the medical marijuana organizations will have to be operational within six months. Once they're operational, it, it typically takes up to six months for a grower and processor to have a product ready to sell to patients. So I, I think realistically we're looking at uh, spring of 2018 as a, a target range for patients being able to walk into dispensaries and, and acquire the product. In the meantime, we have our work cut out for us in terms of engaging physicians and building the patient base. In New York State, for example, there are only 3,000 medical marijuana patients registered uh, because they have not done an effective job getting physicians on board. Um, so to that, uh, with, with that in mind, Secretary Murphy at the Department of Health has been <coughs> convening physician work groups with medical school deans, hospital CEOs, physicians to let them advise us on what type of regulatory framework will encourage them to participate instead of uh, provide a disincentive like they've seen in many states. And I also think our research program will uh, encourage many physicians to participate as well. Um, later in the year we'll begin issuing the medical marijuana ID cards in advance of dispensaries open, uh, opening. 
and assuming we do not completely screw this whole thing up, which is of course still possible, <laughs> in several years, uh, I think we could be looking at as many as 250,000 medical marijuana patients throughout the state. Um, we've seen in other states that patients are spending between $300 and $1,000 a month on average for this medicine, uh, which would mean that uh, in several years we are probably looking at a billion dollar market statewide that we do not have today. Some of the uncertainties we face moving forward. Um, first off, the law creates a medical marijuana advisory board, which in two to three years will have the ability to recommend that the state adopt either additional conditions to be treated or additional forms of application. So we could see in two to three years the medical marijuana advisory board say, let's move to smoking marijuana as a legal form of medical marijuana. That, and not recreational, but still, if you're, if you're recommended by a doctor, they could expand into that area, they could expand the list of conditions. Secondly, of course, uh, many states are moving to recreational marijuana use. Um, I, I think that's well, probably a little premature in Pennsylvania. I think the legislature will, will want to see this program succeed and much of the stigma surrounding this issue dissipate before we move in that type of direction. Uh, but it would certainly have implications for the program uh, if that happened. And then uh, lastly, I think the elephant in the room is, of course, the new Trump administration. Uh, the president-elect has nominated Senator Jeff Sessions to be his attorney general. And Senator Sessions has been uh, a bit openly uh, opposed to medical marijuana in the past, although at his confirmation hearing yesterday, he, he did waver a little bit. So uh, I think it remains to be seen what they'll do. And of course, uh, like many of you, I am certainly not in the business of predicting what the president-elect is going to do on any given day. So uh, I think it'll, it'll remain to be seen. Um, so my contact info is there. I'd be happy to, to open it up and answer any questions. appreciate you listening to me and, and, and taking the time here.